Uh, welcome everybody. We're going to get started here. Um, so for you, for those of you in the audience who uh, don't recognize me, I'm Al Biakal. I'm the outpatient uh, chief resident. I'm uh, standing in for Mike Linnaeus this morning just to give the introduction. So uh, welcome everybody back to Grand Rounds. Um, this morning we're really uh, lucky and pleased to welcome one of uh, UW's very own, um, Dr. Ellen Cosgrove. Uh, Dr. Cosgrove uh, is the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs and a professor in the Department of Medicine. Um, she initially got her MD at Hahnemann Medical College in Philadelphia, uh, trained in the internal medicine department uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, yeah, sorry. Um, reading Mike's introduction, so it's a little bit uh, mixed up. Um, so got her uh, internal medicine residency training at University of Pennsylvania. She's held faculty positions at Hahnemann University as well as University of New Mexico. Um, and then also several uh, visiting professors, professorships for extended periods in um, Japan and China. Uh, her career has been spent uh, studying the education of medical students, residents, and physicians in continuing medical education. She's published numerous papers on the subject, as well as a book on the future of medical education. Additionally, she's served a number of prestigious roles, including uh, previous presidencies of the American College of Physicians, the Association of uh, American Medical Colleges, as well as chair and board member of the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education. Um, today, <clears throat> Dr. Cosgrove will be talking to us about recent efforts to improve the medical school curriculum. Um, here in her talk titled, Continuous Curriculum Improvement, the UW Path to Renewal. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Cosgrove to Grand Round. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction that Dr. Linnaeus wrote for me, but I must say I have never been the president of the American College of Physicians or the Association of American Medical Colleges. <laughs> though I've served in board positions on each of those. Perhaps he's charting the future course of my career. <laughs> I have no commercial relationships, for those of you that are looking to use this for your continuing medical education credit. Continuous curriculum improvement, the UW path to renewal. Five years ago, Dr. Ramsey started us on the course of doing in education what the UW had committed to long ago in both its scientific research and in its clinical care, and that is charting a path to excellence through continuous improvement in quality. In today's talk, I'm going to set the context of curriculum renewal nationally the themes of integration, active learning, flexibility for students, and, and outcomes rather than a process orientation. I'm then going to turn to UW's curriculum renewal, the process we have used, the vision, the values, the proposed model, and then end briefly in talking about next steps. What's so special about educating professionals? <clears throat> There's much more than a knowledge base. It certainly starts with expertise to know, imparting the specialized knowledge required to analyze, plan, make expert judgments. There's also skills to do, applying that knowledge at the patient's bedside, ensuring competency in the special techniques required to find solutions and intervene effectively. But there's also the important element of character the being of a professional, strengthening the moral fiber of students by conscious, conspicuous, and conscientious role modeling to deepen their commitment to be professionals. In this regard, the last curriculum renewal at UW 12 years ago focused on the third of these elements, the character or being through the creation of the college system which has become an international model of mentoring um, in looking at pairing expert faculty with small groups of students to build that sense of professional community while giving them 
bedside skills in physical diagnosis. The national scene, pre-medical education and admissions <clears throat> was ready for a marked change. In 2009, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Association of American Medical Colleges came together after what had been a four-year process <clears throat> of discovery, interviews across the country, and convening expert panels across all of the basic science disciplines and recommended a dramatic shift away from chemistry, calculus, and physics as the basis for the medical college admission test toward more biology. And the test that will be unveiled next year will have half its content in biology as opposed to half its content in chemistry and physics as well as an explicit inclusion of social science domains, specifically psychology, human development, um, social science, the study of uh, affecting change in people and populations, um, and anthropology, understanding some cultural issues. That MCAT changes next year. That is sparking a rethinking in pre-med from courses to competencies. And in fact, the University of Michigan last year dropped all of its entrance course requirements to its medical school and instead um, has adopted the competency approach from the beginning. So the point is, rather than just taking a named course, chemistry 1 or organic chemistry 456, which might mean something different in each school across the country. Um, students will be expected to demonstrate uh, their competencies in specific domains. The other point to the Howard Hughes and AAMC movement was to further push along the idea of integrative thinking. In other words, a single course in biochemistry might satisfy multiple competencies that previously would have had to have been satisfied by taking individual courses in organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and biochemistry. From there, we move to integration in the foundation years, or what used to be called the basic science years in medical curricula. There's a move away from discipline-specific courses with traditional names like biochemistry, anatomy, physiology, toward integrated block courses that emphasize partnership between scientists and clinicians. McMaster started this in 1969, being the first med school that made a complete uh, shift to this. <clears throat> It was part of the PBL movement in the 80s and 90s because um, the schools that adopted a PBL curriculum also adopted block curricula. Harvard um, went in this direction in 1994, UCSF in 2001, and UCLA in 2003. It has become the predominant model for foundations education. Along with the change to the integration and block courses has been a shortening uh, of the period of foundations education and a concomitant earlier entry into uh, significant clinical work. And most medical schools added something on the order of what uh, UW has been doing with the preceptorships 20, 25 years ago. But the big shift in shortening the foundation phase was to move away from observational type experiences, as most of the preceptorships are, and toward getting students into the hands-on, meaty clinical work. Duke <clears throat> now has a um, basic science curriculum that is just 12 months in duration. Michigan's is 68 weeks. Columbia, NYU, University of Pennsylvania, Iowa, Virginia, Emory are 18 months. I just took selected comparator schools. 
Um, but it is very difficult to find a school that is still in the UW model. Now the challenge is for all of this that uh, whatever the method, whether it be traditional courses or the block courses, med schools do a very good job of teaching the biologic and physical sciences as the basis for the practice of medicine, but have not done as well in incorporating other fields, social sciences, business, systems improvement, population health, professionalism in our teaching. And it's recognized that these subjects are essential to the practice of medicine in the environment in which we practice today. Such content as population medicine and statistics, the social determinants of health and disease, quality improvement and patient safety, systems management, health economics, informatics, professionalism, it's very difficult to imagine a competent physician practicing today, much less the competent physician leader who does not have an acquaintance with this complete spectrum of topics. I'm going to switch gear from the content and topic to the method of instruction, and I love this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon because I think it perfectly illustrates actually what I'm doing right now, which is role modeling the information dump as opposed to the interactive method of learning. There's overwhelming evidence that engaging students actively in the learning process produces um, better outcomes. Bransford and his colleagues at <clears throat> Vanderbilt summarized this in how people learn, but the data has been emerging over the last 40 years in cognitive um, science. With straight transmission of information, students are prepared to regurgitate the information back on a multiple choice test or an essay test in that discipline. What's been demonstrated is that they have difficulty applying that knowledge in novel situations or um, in different contexts, and they don't necessarily develop the reasoning skills. It's not always obvious to them what the connections are. So the teaching methods that have become predominant in American medical education are now uh, active learning in the foundations and clinical phases, no shadowing. A focus on seminars and group discussions in order to generate that cognitive dissonance and bring out the peer-to-peer -peer teaching and construction of knowledge, an integration of basic science, social science, and clinical science in all four years. I'd like to switch now from trends in the foundational period to national trends in the clinical years. <coughs> Just four years ago, Neurology was a required subject in only about half of the U.S. med schools. It's now required in 110 of the 131 schools. And with that shift to more schools adopting neurology as a required course, the content has um, been incorporated in the United States Medical Licensure Exam uh, Step 2 Clinical Knowledge. Now. UW was actually one of the forefront schools in adding neurology to its curriculum in the last curriculum renewal 12 years ago. Unfortunately, UW added neurology as a senior year course, and the students take this exam prior to taking the course. One can see where that might be a motivation to continued learning at some later point, but is not necessarily the order in which we like to uh, do our testing for students. Ambulatory care as a defined rotation as opposed to a component of other rotations uh, as of December of last year had been adopted in 52 of the 131 schools, but it is clearly um, coming as 
neurology did in the last wave. Using uh, National Board of Medical Examiner uh, testing for summative assessment in clerkships is now the norm at 124 out of 131 schools for the clerkship in internal medicine and also in all other disciplines except family medicine where 73 of the 131 schools have adopted it. I should note that family medicine does use a national assessment and our school is one of the schools that doesn't use NBME but does use a national assessment which was developed by the American Academy of uh, Family Practice. Using the OSCE during the clerkships for summative assessment has now been adopted in about half of U.S. schools. And the predominant model there is not single subject OSCEs like an OSCE in internal medicine at the end of the clerkship, which is a model that I introduced at Hahnemann in 1987, but um, rather a model where clerkships are grouped around competencies and um, OSCEs are done at the conclusion of uh, a number of clerkships. Again, <clears throat> one of the drivers for this is really to get to the issue, going back to one of the points that I made about the foundation years of can students apply what they've learned in different or novel situations? Can they integrate um, when they're confronted with a new patient or a new problem and demonstrate knowledge in action? And that's the point of the OSCE testing in groups of clerkships. Now, all of this change in medical education has occurred in the context of a period of rapid change in the models of health care. We've moved in my lifetime in medicine from a cost indifference to an extreme cost consciousness um, in terms of medical practice, from largely anecdotal care to uh, more solid foundation in evidence-based care, from an inpatient focus to an ambulatory focus, from group practice to integrated health systems, from an environment where the quality was assumed, especially if you had the right uh, pedigree, to one where performance is measured, and from one where trust was assured to where trust must be earned, doctors appearing on Craigslist or various other social media, for example. Now, the challenge for clinical education that results from this changed model is that the predominant work of healthcare professionals is in the management of chronic diseases over time and largely in non-hospital settings. But clinical education is still focused on episodic care and is predominantly hospital-based. Because of this, new models of clinical education began to emerge about 20 years ago. And again, UW has been in the forefront of this movement on a pilot basis. Tom Norris, Jay Erickson, and others were involved in creating the right program, which is a rural, integrated, um, longitudinal clerkship. So the new models are longitudinal, community-based, chronic disease-oriented, and it has an emphasis on continuity with patients, uh, curriculum teachers and sites. What also emerged within the last 20 years are special tracks within med school. Now, Med schools have always had a focus on graduating what I call the undifferentiated stem cell at the end. The student who, uh, as they walk across the stage, wherever that stage is, I got to walk across the Academy of Music in Philadelphia, and as Andy Lux said when he gave our graduation address at Benaroya, his voice would not have uh, qualified him to be on the stage at Benaroya in any other context. I will 
say the same about mine, to instead thinking about um, a much greater emphasis on preparing students, helping them to uh, separate, individuate, and differentiate during that senior year, and especially during that last half of the senior year, uh, to prepare them for the residency um, specialty that they will enter. And the use of special tracks has been an important movement nationally in helping students to make that transition more effectively. Now, there are three clerkship models. Uh, presently, the predominant model at UW is the block model. That is the traditional clerkship that is discipline specific. Medicine, surgery, psych, OB, peds. I know them in that order. That's the order that I took them 40 years ago. Family medicine did not exist at my school at the time. Now, there's a hybrid type of clerkship in which you have distinct clerkships in a single setting, but by keeping the student in the single setting, it permits students to develop continuing relationships with patients and clinicians over time. And an example of this would be some of our regional tracks, like the Missoula track or the Boise track, where students take multiple, rela uh, multiple clerkships in the same community, but by being in a small enough setting are able to follow some of the same patients over time and um, we are able to offer them some mentoring opportunities um, such as ethics discussions and discussions of difficult um, cases that span clerkships. And then there's the longitudinal integrated model in which the focus is on comprehensive care of a panel of patients over a longer period of time often 36 weeks or more, continuing learning relationships with clinicians and meeting the majority of clinical competencies across multiple disciplines simultaneously. So actually at UW for the last 20 years we've been offering all three models a little bit of each. There's some debate about what constitutes the essential ingredient of a longitudinal clerkship. Is it the care of individual patients as they cross specialties? So meeting that patient in the internist's office, but then following her as she gives birth and then going on to surgery with that patient? Is it care of a community of patients from primary through tertiary care? Is it care of a whole population within a general practice perspective. And often you don't have to make this decision or distinction because by choosing the right setting students and, and allowing sufficient time, students will get all three. There's been intensive study over the last 20 years of longitudinal integrated clerkships with many positive outcomes. In looking at empathy scales um, of students entering clerkships and at the end of the clerkship year, um, students in the longitudinal experience have higher sustained patient-centered attitudes at the end. <coughs> they report receiving more formative feedback from faculty and they perceive that feedback as being more valid. And they have a much higher satisfaction with their curriculum. That has in general been our experience at UW as well, where we have about 10% of the students in these experiences. The question is why the more positive experience? Um, one thought is that students in longitudinal relationships with patients develop a much better understanding of the patient experience and they also are able to make positive contributions to the care of their patient and to facilitate transitions of their patient in care from one setting to another. Um, the second is that knowledge acquisition is progressive and repeated over time with consistent feedback. This 
whole idea of the spiral curriculum at Rochester and um, at San Francisco. And finally, and this will be appreciated by uh, all of you who go between settings with competing or different medical records here at UW, there's much less time needed to orient and adapt to new settings. That onboarding has become a very costly and time-intensive process. But what are the outcomes? It's great that students feel better about it and are much more positive about patients, but it wouldn't mean much if they ended up coming out with less of a fund of knowledge and less skill to apply at the bedside. They perform equal or better in clinical skills and clinical knowledge as tested uh, in national licensing exams in the US, Canada, and Australia. They experience progressively higher levels of patient care responsibility during the clerkship. Um, they um, demonstrate greater flexibility in addressing the students' educational needs. In other words, the students feel that their needs have been addressed in the um, curriculum, um, which gets to the issues that, another issue that we've been working very hard at over the last five years at UW in terms of the learning environment and student perception of having their needs met. And they have a much more positive view of educational continuity. I'm going to switch the focus now to the scholarly project, and it's come with many different names here at UW. We've had a requirement for a scholarly project for since at least the last curriculum renewal, and <clears throat> I see Doug Schott in the office, in the audience. Perhaps you can tell us how long before that um, we had some requirement of a scholarly project. Scholarly projects are now required at most schools. At the time um, when I was a visiting professor in Japan and did a literature review of this topic, about 25 of the then 126 US um, med schools had a graduation requirement of a scholarly project. It's now required at most schools, and one of the things that's driving this is the um, LCME accreditation requirements for school, which don't explicitly say that you have to have students produce a scholarly project, but it does say that you have to provide all students with uh, a sound instruction in um, the principles of human subjects research and the ability to uh, critically analyze um, data and evidence that comes from uh, population science, epidemiologic science, and clinical science um, research, and you have to provide an opportunity for students to demonstrate that they have this knowledge. So when you put the combo of the didactic experience with students have to demonstrate together, one of the easiest ways, easy for us to say, not necessarily easy for students to do, is <coughs> to require a scholarly project. Now we have an interesting um, twist here at UW in that we require the students to do it, but in our current curriculum we don't provide them any specific time in which to do it. So there's a whole list in addition to the required courses and clerkships here at UW, there's a whole list of additional requirements students have to meet in order to get an MD from this school. This is one of them. However, when the subject has been studied at other schools where there's a requirement but no specific time or resources to meet it. This is a source of stress for students, as it has been um, for our students in terms of uh, meeting this requirement. And it's morphed many times in the last um, 12 years to try to address those um, stress points and assure student success. The amount of dedicated time devoted to the scholarly projects um, is quite broad, ranging from a year in the Duke program and at Case Learner. Now, Case has two different med schools. The Learner program is the 
small elite program for 35 students a year that's associated with the Cleveland Clinic where students all do a major scientific project and it's a five-year program students go through tuition free it's paid for by the physicians of the Cleveland Clinic um, they also have the more uh, the Case Western Reserve School of Medicine so Penn Case Western Reserve and Columbia are examples of schools that give 16 weeks Emory gives 20 weeks um, it seems that the predominant mode is to identify uh, a period of time that can be flexed for the students, but in our comparator schools, we should probably be moving towards something like um, allowing the option of up to 16 weeks. In addition, another trend is to say that this is going to be some an element of the curriculum that has dedicated resources. In other words, that doesn't just depend on the kindness of strangers, if you will, the goodness of faculty to take a few students under their wing um, and support student projects either from their own uh, research funds or just out of your own free time. But there are some dedicated resources, faculty leadership for the scholarly project, funds, small amounts usually, but some funds to support student projects going to turn to another national trend, the outcomes movement. In 1998, the ACGME framework chose competence, the midpoint of the Dreyfus skills attainment uh, model as what would form the basis for the um, accreditation system and for the educational system in all graduate medical education in the U.S. Um, many groups have uh, coalesced around the six ACGME competencies and I want to just take a moment um, to distinguish between competence which is a specific level of attainment something that you can demonstrate in action and a competency which is a domain of content like patient care or ethics now the traditional model, which is the one that we currently have at UW, is we have a curriculum, it has educational assess objectives, we do assessments. In a competency-based model, we start with what the health needs of a population are or the needs of health systems, and from that determine what competencies and outcomes we would like to see, and from that determine um, the curriculum. That's um, the end of the theoretical background part or setting the stage part of this talk and for the remaining time I'd like to focus on where we are and where we're going. This in a nutshell is our current curriculum. It does not capture um, the, the potpourri or market basket of assorted other requirements and by that in addition to the scholarly project or triple I we've got things like you have to have a certain number of non-clinical selectives there's multiple other graduation requirements right now we have in the first year 11 basic science courses in the second year 17 organ science courses in both first and second year an ICM course and in both first and second year preceptorships which can range from doing exactly what they did when they were college students trying to get into med school just hanging around somebody's office like a fly on the wall and watching the doctor examine patients to um, if they're lucky enough to get the uh, assignment to the night shift in the ER at Harborview they're allowed to be the first evaluator of patients they're not really the first the, of course, the expert nurses and triage people have made sure uh, of that. But they're allowed to go in and see a patient from the ground up and then present it to the attending. So that's the range of what we offer now. Um, much more predominant towards standing around and watching. 
standing around and watching might still be exciting in the first few weeks of med school. I think you can all relate to the idea that by the end of your second year, especially as you've had the robust colleges program in physical diagnosis, standing around and watching is no longer uh, a thrill. In third year, we have uh, six required clerkships over 42 weeks. In fourth year, we have four required clerkships over 16 weeks and an additional requirement of four elective clerkships over 16 weeks. A very traditional two plus two curriculum. The U W curriculum renewal process actually began, I said five years ago, that was probably the pre-pre-planning. The actual launch of pre-curriculum review led by Suzanne Allen and Michael Ryan was in 2010. It was very comprehensive involving uh, interviews with over a hundred groups in all five states. The vision committee led by Wiley Burke uh, began its work in 2012 and defined the principles that would serve as the basis for our renewal. One big advantage that UW has by being one of the last schools to undertake a curriculum renewal is that we have the opportunity to learn both from the successes of our colleagues and, and these are never published, but you can hear about them in the hallways when you go to the AAMC meeting and the uh, Western Group on Educational Affairs and other forums. We can talk to some of the people that have um, stumbled uh, along the way in curriculum renewal. So one of the things that we learned is that when the going uh, gets to the point where we are in curriculum renewal, where tough choices need to be made about time allocation, uh, having a well-defined set of principles that everyone has previously agreed on uh, serves as a good North Star to guide that phase of the process. So that's why we took a year to do that. Actually, that's why we did it. We took a year because it's UW and we had to include everyone in the process. <laughs> Steering and themes, um, which defined the phases of our curriculum was the work of 2012-2013. And now, um, the work of this academic year has been to develop the proposed structure. So that, this is where we are now. But one thing I will definitely say about the UW process, it is truly about partnerships. Partnerships across states, partnerships across disciplines, partnerships across phases, and partnerships across themes in the curriculum. Who's been involved? In 2012-2013, there were 14 committees with 300 committee members and 40 students involved. 2013-2014, now, seven committees with 109 members. Students were represented on every committee except the governance committee. There were more than 70 authors of proposals for the foundations phase of our curriculum. Now this doesn't mean that 570 people have been involved because some people have been involved at all levels, but it's truly been uh, a, a group effort. And I just want to show who served on the curriculum steering committee and you will recognize quite a number of our colleagues in internal medicine. These are the principles that we emerged from with the, the vision process are that the foundation of our fabric, the border of our fabric is formed by excellence and innovation, two things that have really been hallmarks of UW. The gold bars across are what we decided are the um, eight most important values that would form the basis of our new curriculum. We reaffirmed our commitment to primary care. We made a new affirmation to health equity, and that includes dedication to advocacy in 
health equity, public health, and global health. Ethics and professionalism, again, one of the areas in which UW under Wiley Burke has been a leader in developing the whole field of empirical ethics. Quality and safety, and the work of Tom Gallagher and others to look at um, really weaving this into our curriculum in a much more meaningful way. Communications and interprofessionalism, and again, an area in which UW has been in a leadership role and recognized for that nationally with the work of Karen McDonough from this department and many, many others. Uh, diversity, cultural awareness, cultural responsiveness, community. Again, uh, UW um, has been recognized as a leader in this area at the national level with some of the programs that um, David Acosta and others um, have developed. And we're looking forward with our new chief diversity officer to taking us to the next level. Uh, lifelong learning. This is an area um, including evidence-based medicine, what we're doing now in MIDM, but much more, problem-solving, critical thinking. And those of you who were lucky enough to be at the uh, presentation that Chuck Friedman gave a couple of years ago will recognize the importance of trying to practice medicine in a cloud-supported environment. And last but not least, scientific discovery or scholarship. Our new curriculum theme at UW is lifting the burden of disease. We will be working with the Institute of um, Health Metrics and Evaluation to develop content related to this theme that's going to be woven through all the courses and clerkships. This builds on the really landmark work uh, that came out of UW, the only work to ever be recognized with a Lancet double issue is um, Murray's work on the global burden of disease. Um, and we have committed to taking the top 40 diseases and integrating them into each block, driving the selection of clinical correlates. So our new curriculum will have a scientific foundations phase of about 18 months integrating blocks of medical science in a clinical context and having a meaningful clinical experience, a new longitudinal clerkship. Clinical foundations required clerkships with integrated basic science and specific rotations in Seattle. Career exploration and focus which will include some specialty-specific preparation and more meaningful scholarship. I'd like to recognize the Immersion, Transition, and uh, Scholarship Committee, uh, led by Norm Beauchamp with um, co-leader Conrad Lyles, and you'll see a number of other medicine faculty. They recommend an immersion experience to begin med school of four weeks in length in which students will get a finite set of clinical skills that will enable them to get a jump start on going into clerkship, a grounding in professionalism, ethics, and the culture of medicine, exposure to service in the communities that we serve, and an appreciation of interprofessionalism. There will be transitions between each of the blocks two to four weeks in foundations and one to two weeks in patient care in which we will uh, be able to offer a mixture of required and elective course offerings but also have time for student rest and remediation. I'd like to point out the foundations committee which was chaired by Tom Montine and co-chaired by Robert Steiner. And again, you'll see some names from internal medicine. So this is the proposed uh, foundation, the new blocks. We intend to start med school in August with this uh, immersion block, and then um, begin with uh, molecular and cellular basis of disease, invaders and defenders, blood and cancer, the circulatory system, energetics and homeostasis. 
woven throughout all of these courses will be anatomy and imaging. Um, one of the big trends is to, and in fact some schools have done it by adopting a radiology block that's required, but many more schools are adopting the approach we're adopting here of integrating a much more meaningful and important role for imaging beginning at the beginning of the curriculum and going through in the clinical years with skills like point of care ultrasound, for example, so that imaging becomes a very important theme through the curriculum. Uh, population health and frontiers of medicine, you see that ICM is throughout all blocks and the longitudinal clerkship will be a full day a week devoted to um, a clerkship activity, which over an 18 month period gives students 62 days of contact time. And to put that into context, our current senior year rotations give students 20 days of contact time. Our current average uh, six week block is 30 days of contact time. So with the 62 days of contact time over 18 months, this will be a very um, meaningful opportunity. In the second year, in the summer, they'll have their choice of four weeks of RUOP, um, the MSRT research program, um, global health. Um, the idea is to get the students to engage in something during that period. They'll return then for mind, brain, and behavior. And life cycle. And the whole thing will end um, by winter break. They'll come back for a transitions block of 12 weeks, which will include board prep, an identified four weeks for uh, research or scholarship, an intensive week of transition to clerkships. For students with a serious interest in bench research, um, this would be an opportunity then to tack on or float the first clerkship block and thus have the 16 weeks of uh, time available for uh, a science project right there at the end of second year, or others could do it later. Here's the patient care committee chaired by Richard V with Mark Whipple as the co-chair. And again, you can see a number of your internal medicine colleagues listed. The guiding principles were vertical integration of basic science learning and clinical activity, and horizontal integration among specialties and disciplines. The content should be competency-based and the required clerkship should meet competency goals and objectives that are relevant for all students. Also that clerkships with material covered in USMLE would be completed by fall of the fourth year. And students would have more time for career exploration prior to the residency match application. So this is the new proposed clinical year. 12-week blocks that take some of our current discipline-specific blocks and put them together by competency. So care of the hospitalized patient would include the eight weeks of internal medicine, care of the hospitalized adult, and four weeks of um, pediatrics, care of the hospitalized child. It's anticipated that the overall block um, would have cooperation in the design of some of the didactic experiences and experiences like balance groups or ethics discussions that could um, run through the whole 12 weeks. And it's anticipated that this one week intercession would give us an opportunity to um, do testing like OSCEs that would transcend more than one discipline care of the surgical perioperative and peripartum patient includes um, surgery, anesthesia, and the inpatient aspects of OBGYN. Care of the patient with disorders of the mind, brain, and nerves, and an elective is psychiatry, 
neurology, so we're moving it into that junior year, um, and an elective, and then uh, a new integrated primary and family care block that um, would give every student at least a 12-week uh, longitudinal experience in the clerkship year. Now, going along the bottom, I've illustrated a longitudinal integrated clerkship, and I had mentioned we have about 10% of our students in longitudinal clerkships now. We uh, have committed to offering this opportunity to 50% of our students in the new curriculum, which is an achievable goal because that takes in the number that are currently in tracks or the hybrid model. Length of internal medicine clerkship. Um, looking at our 11 elite comparator institutions. Currently 12 weeks at Case Western at the, not the Learner Program, but the Case Western Reserve Program. 12 weeks at Cornell, 12 weeks at UCLA. It's currently eight weeks at Dartmouth, Duke, Hopkins, Michigan, Penn, UCSF, and Yale. The proposed phase three or senior year you will see that senior year now begins in April of their third year of med school. Um, and the three required courses are going to be a sub-I, an advanced care of the undiagnosed patient, and emergency medicine, but it might be, um, a student might satisfy this requirement either with our current emergency medicine or with pediatric emergency medicine or with a surgery emergency medicine block. And advanced outpatient care. I will point out that UW is also a leader in an advanced outpatient care block um, in a blocked form with what Doug Powell and Chris Knight do with senior students in um, their medicine clinic rotation in a longitudinal form with what Renata Thronson has been doing with the student volunteer clinic on Tuesday nights for the last five years at Harborview, where students sign up and follow a panel of patients through their entire senior year. Uh, the competencies would be to, um, the advanced care competencies of taking care of outpatients. Clinical selectives of six additional four-week blocks and then a capstone experience, which would be that um, tracking experience once students have um, settled on the field they're going into. Um, more and more residencies are setting their milestones with entry requirements for students. And a number of national organizations, the American College of Surgery was the first to develop a model curriculum that includes a revisit to anatomy plus um, uh, specific surgical skills, but many other residencies are hard on their heels, and this is an opportunity for us to be creative and develop new curriculum. We also have a commitment to a much more robust scholarship with resources devoted to it, and as I mentioned, specific time. So given the lateness of the hour, I'm not going to dwell on that aspect. Right now, we are in our listening and comment period, and I'm sure you have thoughts about having heard this presentation today. We have a number of listening sessions, and the point of those is for us to listen to you, not to talk as I have done today, um, in which we're going to refine this proposal that I presented today um, at Suncadia so that we can begin our working groups in May to develop these new courses and clerkships. Our target implementation date for the new curriculum is August 2015. And our LCME reaccreditation re self-study begins just six months later in January of 2016. We're developing our curriculum as a community. These course teams are going to have content experts from disciplines and have representation from each first year site and representation from basic scientists and clinicians. Now, warning, our first try on all of this may not produce the desired outcome. 
which is why, again, we've reaffirmed our commitment to continuous improvement through a collaborative leadership model. So thank you very much for your attention today. And I'll be available either in this room or outside if you would like to um, have some additional comments. Or please send me your comments. Uh, Sarah Shirley, who's here, is collecting all of the comments. And we are going to analyze them for themes and use them to revise um, and refine our presentation. Thank you. Dr. Cosgrove, do you have time for a couple of questions? Yes, I do. Okay, here's one. Um, I have a quick question um, about the uh, integration of the whammy sites into the new curriculum. Uh, and I can completely appreciate that this is such a huge undertaking made even more difficult with the decentralization of the medical school. So how will the whammy sites be integrated in the new preclinical curriculum? And then similarly, well, how will that change for the clinical curriculum? And then what are the advantages and disadvantages you see with that? So the one aim of this was to achieve much more congruence with the whammy sites than exist today. In the new curriculum, um, at all six sites where we give the first year curriculum, we will be giving the exact same courses with the exact same content at the exact same time. And students will take the same exam. So um, we're working together with our WAMI partners on developing these new courses. So they're not developing a whole new separate courses at each site. We're coming together on that. Are there any more questions? I saw one over here, maybe. Oh. Why don't you jump in while okay. we find the mic? Um, there's some medical schools that advocate taking U.S. Assembly Step 1 after the clinical clerkships um, rather than before the clinical clerkships. Can you comment on that or whether that was discussed as an option? That was discussed in detail. NYU was one of the first schools, and it was one of our um, model schools for our curriculum. And they reported at a national meeting achieving a um, one standard deviation um, above the mean improvement in their um, USMLE scores by changing the uh, timing, or by the combo of changing the timing and the curriculum. <clears throat> but you also have to look at this. Looking at the USMLE score alone as a method of um, evaluating your curriculum is very deeply flawed because, as Erica Goldstein often says, we could give our students a pile of books and the USMLE template and lock them in a closet, and they're motivated and they know what they need to know at the end, so they'd come out uh, and study. Even students from crappy med schools pass the USMLE at greater than 90%. Um, so, one big criticism of attributing the gain in USMLE score to the change in timing is that the NYU students have completed three full years of medical education and they're taking the test with a whole group of students who are, have only completed two years. We put a lot of debate into this and decided that asking students to take USMLE Step 1, Step 2 CK, Step 2 CS, all in that summer while they're trying to do their residency applications would actually increase rather than decrease the stress on students. And one of the major factors that we're dealing with now is the incredible stress that our uh, students are feeling about USMLE. I actually had students last year at orientation come up to me and ask me about what I would recommend for their USMLE test prep study. So it does delaying that first chance to get your to cut your teeth on a national test and see where you come out for another whole year, um, I think would not do well from the wellness perspective. And that's a perspective that I totally ignored in this talk, but the wellness perspective 
has been an important and intentional part of this curriculum design with its periods of rest and its periods of um, opportunity to remediate in shorter blocks rather than longer blocks. So we can talk more about that later. But we did consider it and for that reason decided against it. Thank you, Dr. Cosgrove. Thank you.